Good morning. My name is Vanessa. And my name is Spencer. I wonder what time of the year it is. I just want you guys to know that it may be a little cold outside, but here at CCC, our hearts are warm, our smiles are big. We can't wait for the day that you can actually come and see us. But welcome to our service today. May you have a blessed day and a very, very blessed giving season. Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this wonderful time of the year. We thank you for being in each and every one of our homes. We thank you for our online guests, Lord, and may you be a blessing to each and every one of us. Save us in your kingdom is my prayer. For Christ's sake, amen. Amen. Good morning and happy Sabbath. My name is Dion Finney, and I pray that you had a blessed week this week. Before I start with the announcements, just wanting to remind those who have not yet done so, please feel free to sign up for our electronic announcements, and you can do so by going to Columbia Center, sda.org slash bulletin. You know, this past Friday, we had our virtual agape feast. It was a wonderful time. We saw faces we haven't seen in a while. We did shout outs and we talked of God's goodness. It was really good to see those that we saw. And so when we have other events coming up in the future, we'd like you to be a part of that. So please, once you sign up, you will get an email of such events. And all you have to do is click on the link and you'll be in. Well, tis the season of giving. And please remember to include on your gift list this year, families we are seeking to support during the pandemic. We invite you to participate in our gloves and socks drive for children and gift cards for their parents. If you care to donate, please do so through the food drive designation in our online giving. Once again, that's gloves and socks for the kids and gift cards for their parents. We would like to remember and honor those we have loved and lost this past year. The last Sabbath in December, we will take a moment to reflect and remember uh, those that we have loved and lost. If you care to honor someone, please do so by sending in uh, three pictures of your loved one along with their name, the birth and death date, and your family name. These items can be sent to communications at ccc7da.org. Please send this no later than December 13. Once again, the items that are needed are pictures, three pictures, landscape preferably, along with their name, birth date, dates, and your family name. Well, we're celebrating birthdays today. We have two, Kalia Lester and also Eugene Reed, affectionately known as Pop. We are so glad that you're part of the CCC family and we celebrate with you and pray that God will continue to bless you tremendously. Enjoy your birthday through the rest of the month. Just have a fantastic time. Well, these are our announcements for today. I pray God will continue to bless all of you as we enjoy his special day, this Sabbath day. Please join me by bowing your heads as we invite the Lord's presence into our worship service this morning. Heavenly Father, once again, we bow our hearts before you, inviting your presence into our worship service in our homes this morning. Lord God, we live in awesome and frightening times. As many people are fighting the COVID virus across our nation, across this land, this world, we ask that you be with each and every soul, dear God. Strengthen them, encourage them, and heal them according to your mercy and grace. Lord, we have saw many of your children go to sleep this past week, and our hearts go out to the families 
And we ask that each family, dear God, that you bless them with the presence of your Holy Spirit. Comfort them, dear God, and help them understand it's only asleep for a little while. As soon as soon we will all see your face coming in the cloud. Dear God, there was ever a time we need to outpour in your Holy Spirit upon each and every one of your church members, your family. We ask that you do it now. Give us your Holy Spirit, dear God, that it will fortify us for the days and the trials that lie ahead. But most importantly, dear God, give us your Holy Spirit that we will boldly go out and proclaim your love for this dying world and encourage souls to remain faithful and to cling to you. We thank you, dear God, for your manservant who will be giving us a word from you this morning. We ask that you bless them in a mighty way. Father, you know our needs, you know our, our parts, and we ask that you bless us according to your mercy and your grace. So come, Lord God, come, please. Spend a little time with us this morning. For we ask this prayer in Christ's blessed name, who died for all of our sins. Amen. I don't possess houses or land, fine clothes or jewelry. Troubles and trials in this old world, my lot seems to be. But I know a Christ who paid the price down here on Calvary. Christ is all, all and all the world to me. Christ is all, he's everything to me. Christ is all. And see, Christ is without Him, nothing I be. Christ is all, all and all, the world to me. Yes, Christ is all, means more to me. And this world's riches. He is my side, my guiding light through pathless seas. Yes, it's mighty nice to know a Christ who will my friend be. Christ is all. All and all the world to me, Christ is all, He's everything to me, Christ is all, He rules land and sea. Christ is all without him, nothing I'd be. Christ is all, all and no, this world to me. Christ is all, 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 everything to me. Christ is all He rules land and sea Christ is all Without Him nothing I'd be Christ is all all and all Christ is all all and all, Christ is all, all and all, the world to me. Good morning, 
everyone, and welcome to today's service. Like the psalmist records, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord and let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. I am grateful that God has spared our lives. In spite of tragedy and triumph, we're able to come together to lift up his holy name and to open his word. I have been asking the Lord for a special word today, and I believe that he has answered and delivered. But before we begin, I'm going to invite you to bow your heads with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that we have this opportunity once again on this year, beautiful Sabbath day, to come apart and rest a while and to sit at your feet with your open word and seek to see what you have declared for us today. So give us your Holy Spirit who will guide us in our thought processes and that will lead us along the path of consecration and surrender. We thank you for hearing and answering our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your Bibles, and I hope that you do, today's teaching is entitled, His Robe or Mine. His Robe or Mine. With the challenges that we are facing today, it is imperative that you and I understand the essentials of salvation. It's what the New Testament calls the kerygma, especially when we consider the fact that God has given us a finite amount of time on this earth in which we can invest for eternity. His robe or mine? Well, whose robe are we talking about? And what is this robe? There are three passages I want to share with you that shape the framework or the contours of today's teaching, and we will probably lead into next week as well. If you have your Bibles, if you would turn with me to Isaiah chapter 61 and verse 10, and there are three initial passages that I want to share with you. In Isaiah 61, 10, the man of God proclaims, I am overwhelmed with joy in the Lord my God, for he has dressed me with the clothing of salvation and draped me in a robe of righteousness. I am like a bridegroom dressed for his wedding or a bride with her jewels. And then if you look at Matthew 22 and verses 11 through 14, but when the king came in to meet the guests, he noticed a man who wasn't wearing the proper clothes for the wedding. Friend, he asked, how is it you are here without wedding clothes? But the man had no reply. Then the king said to his aides, bind his hands and feet and throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth for many are called, but few are chosen. This is, these are interesting passages because it clearly is talking about a robe of righteousness, a garment of salvation. And so clearly Isaiah is looking proleptically with the eye of faith into the New Testament times when Jesus Christ would come. And he's dealing with the essentials of salvation. It was important for Israel of old to understand this, but also looking forward to the future so that when Christ would come the second time, there is an equipping that God expects us to have. He expects us to be united with him and he uses this parable in Matthew 22 in the form of this wedding. Now, at Seventh-day Adventist, we know that this has tremendous significance for us of theological importance. But the thing that I want to focus on today is that this man was a part, in Matthew 22, he was a part of the people of God. He had responded to the invitation to come for this wedding. And he actually had received a wedding garment, but he did not have it on. And when Jesus came, and when the friend came, rather, wanting to know, how did you get in here without the wedding clothes, without this wedding garment, the man was perplexed. So therefore, it is assumed then that he certainly had a knowledge about the wedding garment. He knew about the wedding garment, but he did not have it on. His robe or mine. Well, this other passage in Zechariah chapter 3, verses 1 through 4 one of my favorite passages that gives a great representation of the gospel of Jesus Christ puts these two passages together, which helps to crystallize the teaching theme for today. His robe or mine. In Zechariah chapter 3, 
we find the story where Joshua, the high priest, is standing before the angel of the Lord. And Satan, the accuser, kind of reminds me of what John the Revelator says, Satan, who is the accuser of the brethren. Satan is standing at the right hand of the angel of God, and here is Joshua standing before him. He is grief-stricken because the garments that he has on are tattered, they are torn, they are soiled. There probably are deep perspiration stains full of holes. In fact, let's read it. The accused, then the angel showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord. The accuser, Satan, was there at the angel's right hand, making accusations against Joshua. And the Lord said to Satan, I, the Lord, reject your accusations, Satan. Yes, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebukes you. This man is like a burning stick that has been snatched from the fire. Joshua's clothing was filthy as he stood there before the angel. So the angel said to the other standing there, take off his filthy clothes. And turning to Joshua, he said, see, I have taken away your sins. And now I am giving you these fine new clothes. Then I said, they should also place a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean piece, a priestly turban on his head and dressed him in new clothes while the angel of the Lord stood by. This is a beautiful representation of what Jesus Christ does with us as we are standing before him full of sin. Tattered lives, soiled reputations, full of guilt and remorse, not being able to shun and to totally forsake the lifestyle of sin that we have been ingrained in, although we know better. And Satan is standing there at our right hand, accusing us, whispering in our ear, telling us, you know you know better. You know what God's word says. You've been trained in the school of the prophets. You've gone to, 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 to his schools. You've gone through Bible studies. You know the word of God, and yet you still find yourself in this predicament. And we find ourselves without any defense. It is implausible to think that God would, would continue to overlook our mishaps, which is what Satan wants us to believe. But just as he was standing by the side of the angel and looking at Joshua here and accusing him, and his accusations were accurate, they were true. Satan was not being deceptive. He was not being misleading because his clothes were dirty. Well, we know that what this symbolized. Joshua was a high priest and he represented the people. And those soiled clothes, those dirty clothes represented the lives of the people. They had the gospel message in the sanctuary service, but yet they had the problem with the power of sin in their lives. And these were the chosen people of God. And so Satan is making a case against them. Satan is basically saying, God, how can the Israelites be your chosen nation? How can they be the head and not the tail as you have proclaimed when they are still sinking in known sin of their own volition? They are deciding to follow their own pride and their own inclinations as opposed to a thus saith the Lord. And as the angel is looking there, he realizes that their, their, their clothes are dirty. He knows that their lives are broken and torn and fractured and full of sin. But yet the declaration goes out. The angel of the Lord tells him, remove his dirty clothes and give him brand new clothes. Now, I want you to get this because it's, it is important to understand that as Joshua is receiving new clothes, it's not the result of any work or effort that he has exerted. Joshua receives these new clothes, not because of something that he did. He didn't take them off and then go and have them washed and then had them pressed and put them back on. No, Joshua is standing there in full surrender. He is acknowledging his condition. He knows his garments are dirty. He is not making excuses. 
No, he accepts the reality and the fact of the, the facts of the situation. He is a recipient of this grace of God. So he is standing there. And now as Satan is accusing, the Lord tells him, shut up, your, shut up, Satan, close your mouth, because I have provided the answer and the relief for Joshua, who is representing the people of God. Kind of goes back to the title, his robe or mine, his robe or mine. In the book of Galatians chapter three and verse seven, Paul enters into our conversation and into our discussion and study because Paul also knows that it is impossible for us to clean ourselves up. He realizes that it is absolutely essential that we be connected to Jesus Christ and that we understand that in order to be restored to a right relationship with God, there is something that we must do, but there is also something that God does. In Galatians chapter 3 and verse 27, he says, And all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ like putting on new clothes. In other words, you're going to have to shed your life of sin by acknowledging it through repentance because the Holy Spirit has brought conviction to us and then by accepting and believing in Jesus Christ as the sacrifice that was made, the shedding of his blood for my sins and for yours, it now has freed me from the penalty of sin, the penalty which is death. And I am now, therefore, reunited in fellowship with God. And so when I come to him, I am now putting on Christ. I love that, that phrase that Paul uses. I'm putting on Christ, and it's like putting on brand new clothes. Now, Jeremiah gives us a great sneak peek in terms of this righteousness, and it combines with Pauline theology about putting on Jesus Christ and then turn ties into this lesson that we see in Zechariah chapter three. Listen to what Jeremiah says in Jeremiah 23 verses five and six. For the time is coming, says the Lord, when I will raise up a righteous descendant from David's line, and this will be his name. The Lord is our righteousness. You see, this is, shows the wonderful symmetry and the consistency between the Old Testament and the New Testament. It, it, this demonstrates one of the biblical hermeneutical principles, which is a fancy word, just, just means principles of interpretation, where when we're looking at truth, all of Scripture is inspired by God. So here a little, there a little, line upon line and precept upon precept. If I see the message of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament, I ought to be able to line it up and see it in the New Testament. And here, Jeremiah is saying his name, Jesus Christ, the descendant that comes through the line of David, Jesus Christ, the son of man, Jesus Christ, who is now seated at the right hand of the father in a place of honor and glory, who is interceding on your behalf and on mine. This same Jesus Christ, who lived his life and sacrificed it on Calvary, dying for you and for me. This same Jesus Christ, who the Father was reconciling the world to himself because he was in Jesus, he is the Lord. The Lord is our righteousness, and this is his name. You see, beloved, when I put on his robe then, I am putting on Jesus Christ, as Paul says, put on Christ. And I'm also putting on his righteousness. I'm using and utilizing and taking advantage and engaging and employing the righteousness of Jesus. So then what is his robe of righteousness? You might be wondering, well, what is that? Is it just a matter of right doing? Is it all dealing with just activity and task? Or is it a mindset? Or it is, a, 
Is it a combination of all of the above? Listen to what Paul also tells us, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verses 19. He says, for God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. For God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. So this robe of righteousness then, when we talk about his robe or mine, this should be very obvious and clear to you as to why I, there's no way that my robe can compare to his robe. Because the scriptures declare all of my righteousness is as a filthy rag. It is soiled. It is dirty. It is useless. It is void of any cleansing agency. But Jesus, he is the one who was the offering for sin, as Paul says here. It is because of his blood that was shed on Calvary, that I am now standing free from the guilt and now free from the power and free from the penalty of sin. And it is Jesus then, his righteousness, that makes me right with God. Now, possibly in your King James Version, it says that we are justified. We are, in other words, we are declared righteous. We are declared clean. Doesn't mean that we, he makes us clean. He declares that we are key, clean. So when I'm putting on his robe of righteousness, I am understanding that there is a dynamic that must take place in my standing with God. And we're going to get to this in a minute. You see, my standing with God needs to be brokered because there has been a rupture. You'll recall in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve after they have partaken of the fruit and God goes in search of them, calling them out. The voice of the God goes walking through the garden in the cool of the evening. Adam, where are you? And of course, we know Adam's response. He's hiding. And the Lord says, well, why were you hiding? Because I was naked. Well, how did you know you were naked? How did you become naked? And then Adam plays the blame game. The woman that you created and gave me, she, she, she twisted my arm and made me eat the fruit. And we discovered that we were naked. And then we ran and got some fig leaves together and put them together to cover our shame and our nakedness. And then, of course, God then delivers the verdict. He told them that the day that you eat of this fruit, you will surely die. And so, therefore, their communion, their standing with the Father was broken. Heretofore, they had been able to walk with God. They had open face-to-face -face communion. God and Jesus actually took Adam uh, along and said, here are all the animals that I have created, Adam. I'm going to give you the privilege. Let me see your creative genius and, and, and your spontaneity. You get to name all of the animals. They had that type of relationship, one-on-one, -on -one, face to face but after sin came into the realm of existence, after this virus, this ultimate COVID-19 of sin, where it caused Adam and Eve to trust the voice of the viper and the arch enemy of God, the ultimate deceiver, they trusted him as opposed to trusting God. And therefore, they were excommunicated out of the Garden of Eden. They no longer could have face-to-face -face communion with them. And they are now standing in a position where they are now isolated from God. I hope someone is listening to me today. But the Lord did not leave them without hope. And that's why Genesis 3.15 is the very first promise of the everlasting gospel that we find in all of the holy canon. Genesis 3.15 is the John 3.16 of the Old Testament. The Lord then told uh, Adam and Eve, there is a way that has been provided. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit decided in the council of peace in heaven long before God squeezed time 
out of the bosom of eternity that there would be a plan how man could be saved and how man could be restored and declared right with God. And so therefore, when we look at this, when we look at this conundrum that Satan and sin has thrown this ball of confusion on this planet, we no longer have this right standing with God, but praise the Lord for Jesus Christ and the message of the everlasting gospel. We now have the ability to receive the robe of Christ's righteousness where it is his mercy and his mediation that makes us right with God. Now, it is painfully clear why we need his robe of righteousness. Just like it's painfully clear, I can't use mine as an option because this word declares all of my righteousness, all of my right doing is as a filthy rag. So why is it that we need his robe? A few passages Paul tells us in Romans chapter 3, verses 9, 10, 19, and 23. I'm going to read them. For we have already shown that all people, whether Jews or Gentiles, are under the power of sin. I'm going to stop right there. See, this is why we need Jesus. We are under the power of sin. It is a power that is irresistible, a power that defies our intellectualism. What do I mean by that? I know that sin is wrong. And you know that sin is wrong. I know intellectually what God has declared. I know what is evil and what is good, what is appropriate and what is inappropriate, what is moral and what is immoral. The things that I know I ought to do and the things that I know I should never do. But having an awareness, knowing this is not sufficient to withstand the power of sin. There is this alluring intoxicating siren song that pulls us and goes deep into our hearts and into our spirits. And for some of us, we have lived a life of sin. Some of it has come naturally, as we say, through prenatal influences and, and hereditary traits that have been passed on genetically from one generation to the other. And then there is just something within us that naturally gravitates to the dark side. It is a power. It, it is irresistible at times. And this is why we need Christ's righteousness. I have seen men uh, and women who have been drug free, who have been clean for years. And I saw one brother who had been clean for over 10 years. And then seemingly out of the clear blue, he found himself right back at that old crack house. The power of sin, in spite of our willpower, in spite of our promises. In fact, we're going to read a quote from the pen of inspiration that talks about all of our promises are like ropes of sand. And it becomes a source of discouragement to us. It is impossible for us on our own to resist the power of sin. This is why I need Jesus. Alcoholics Anonymous is good. Support groups for, 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 chemical, for substance abuse. And, and even the, the medical intervention that we get for those who have chemical imbalances in their minds. And, and there is a, a, there is a disequilibrium that is taking place in their minds, in their brains, and in their bodies. But the power of sin can only be checkmated and counteracted by the power of Jesus Christ. Let's go on in verse 10, where Paul says in Romans 3, as the scriptures say, no one is righteous, not even one, to show that the entire world, verse 19, to show that the entire world is guilty before God. And verse 23, for everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. So it really doesn't matter how long you have been in the church or how many offices you have held or how many generations you have been a Seventh-day Adventist 
or a follower of Jesus. Like Isaiah says in chapter five, the whole head is sick and the whole heart faints. Our condition and our situation is so dire that it demands direct divine intervention. The only panacea is Jesus Christ, not Buddha, not anything else. It is, it is Jesus. So what is needed now then, as we look at this robe of righteousness, and, and, and that is his name, the Lord is our righteousness. The reason why Joshua in Zechariah chapter three was able to stand there and, and, and not receive, not do anything rather, of his own accord in order to change his garments. He received these new clothes, these clean clothes and a fresh turban. It was a direct act by the angel of the Lord. What is needed then in order for us to receive the righteousness of Jesus and to appreciate it and to learn how to luxuriate in it, Paul tells us in Romans 2 and verse 29, Paul says, no, a true Jew is one whose heart is right with God. And true circumcision is not merely obeying the letter of the law. Rather, it is a change of heart produced by the spirit. Now, you might be wondering, now, wait a minute, what is Paul talking about here? Uh, not a true Jew. Why are you talking about Judaism? Well, you have to understand and remember the context, the historical context of the book of Romans is why Paul was writing this. You'll recall that uh, we have no idea who started this church in Rome. Religious tradition, our religious traditions and history, New Testament history uh, ties this to what happened on the day of Pentecost because you had Jews who had come to Pentecost from all over the then known world from Rome. And it is from some of the early church fathers in their writings said that there were some folk who came there on the day of, day of Pentecost they heard Peter preaching. They saw the miracles that were performed and they accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. On one day, more than 3,000 were baptized. On another day, more than 5,000. Well, they went back to Rome. These lay folk, laity, went back to Rome, began to preach the word and share what they knew at that time. And that became the nucleus of the church that Paul is now writing to. So it was a church that had a mixture of a few Jews, but a lot of Gentiles. And the theological dispute and the animosity that crept into the early church between Jews and Gentiles and circumcision and no circumcision and Judaism that basically said to be a Christian, you really need to be a good Jew first. So therefore they were going out and proselyting folk and telling them before you can be a Christian, you first have to be circumcised. What Paul is saying here now, that's the context for this, for the book of Romans and in chapter two. What Paul is saying and the gist that you and I need to get is that heart religion is what's required. You might know your Seventh-day Adventist denominational history backwards and forwards, and it is good. I appreciate and I welcome and I love our denominational history. You might know all of the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation, and you should, because all scripture was given by inspiration of God, and it will help the man and woman of God. But if we have all of this knowledge and all of this information, and our hearts have not been circumcised by the Holy Spirit, if heart religion is not a part of our practical daily experience, then all this other, all this other information and all these other things that we're doing becomes extraneous stuff. Paul says, whose heart is right with God. This is how you define a follower. And having a different heart, it doesn't happen by your own initiative. Notice what he says in the latter part of verse 29. It is a change of heart produced by the Spirit. So it has nothing to do 
with the service that I am doing. Let me reframe that. The service and the good deeds that we do in helping humanity, it flows out. That is the product of a heart that has been converted, a heart that has been touched, a heart that has been changed by God's Holy Spirit. There is this working that takes place in us. Now, I have another question that I want you to consider. When we look at all of this, his robe or mine, we, we know then that in order to be made right with God, it is really zeroing in on how is my relationship with God restored? So here's the question. How are we made right with God? Well, let me first start with the negative. Let me tell you what it is not. Romans 3.20, for no one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. The law simply shows us how sinful we are. Now, beloved, I could preach an entire sermon, teach an entire lesson just on this one passage. And, and I'm not going to fly over it, but no, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. But I think we need to focus in on that when we talk about being made right with God, I want you to think back to the Garden of Eden. When Adam and Eve sinned, they lost the ability to communicate with God face to face, and they were thrown out of the garden. But when Jesus then revealed to them in Genesis 3.15 that there would be a sacrificial system, and he gave them the task of bringing the lamb that was out without spot and without blemish. And that's what they would offer to God as a sacrifice after confessing their sins over the head of that lamb. And that lamb represented Jesus Christ, the true lamb of God who would come in the New Testament time and would die on the cross and shed his blood. And therefore, that would cleanse us of our sins. And then we would be restored to a right relationship with God. The way that Adam and Eve were restored to a right relationship with God was that they believed in the sacrificial system that pointed to Jesus. It was not the fact that they kept bringing a lamb every morning and every evening. Every morning and every evening. They then, in that service, would transfer their sins symbolically from themselves to the head of that lamb. Therefore, my sins, when I confess to Jesus Christ, he forgives me of my sins. And then I am restored in a right relationship with the Father, where now the Father sees me through the lens of Jesus, through the life and the face and the hands of Jesus Christ. I am now restored and now I am declared righteous. I can now come boldly to the throne of grace asking for mercy. I don't have to come with my hat in my hand. I can come and say, Father, I claim the name and the blood of Jesus Christ, your son and my savior. And so here I am made right. Not by keeping the law, not by keeping the Sabbath, not by honoring my mother and my father. No, that law simply shows me that I have broken it, that I am sinful and my deficiencies. Let's keep reading Romans 3, 21 to 25. But now God has shown us a way to be made right with him without keeping the requirements of the law. God has shown us this way, the way, the real deal on how you're made right with him. In other words, how you are declared righteous. Verse 22, we are made right with God or declared right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. You see, theologians use this term Christocentric. In other words, Christ must be at the center. In my love relationship with him, that is the thing that holds me. That is the thing that binds me. 
to him. That is the thing that restores me in a right standing with God the Father, and therefore it becomes my motivation and my obedience then to God is a result of my connection and my love of Jesus Christ and receiving his power through his Holy Spirit. Verse 23, for everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet God in his grace freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty for our sins. Verse 25, people are made right with God when they believe. When they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life shedding his blood. That is how we are declared right. Now, some might think, well, see, all I got to do is just believe that and then I can go on and live my life however I want to. No, that is not what God's word teaches. In fact, Paul says the exact opposite. Do we then forsake the law? Do we forget about the law? Paul says, absolutely not. But this is a point in time this is this standing with God and before God so that he is no longer viewing us with our sins. Jesus is declaring that we are righteous. In order to receive that declaration, we must believe in him. Our faith must be rock solid in him. Romans 3, 26 to 30, he makes sinners right in his sight when they believe in Jesus. So here's the connection now. This is why you need his robe as opposed to yours. Or let me reframe it this way. If you think you're being made right with God because you return a faithful tithe, because you keep the Sabbath, uh, because you're doing all of the things that the church and the Bible declares that you ought to do, and you're refraining from the things that, that you said, that, that we are saying that you shouldn't do, that somehow that makes you right with God. No, just the opposite. Just the opposite. He makes sinners right in his sight when they believe in Jesus. In other words, for me to be declared righteous, I can't have that separate from Jesus Christ. I have to have his robe. Verse 27, can we boast then that we have done anything to be accepted by God? No, because our acquittal is not based on obeying the law. Our acquittal is based on our faith. So we are made right with God through faith. Verse 28, so we are made right with God through faith and not by obeying the law. There is only one God and he makes people right with himself only by faith. This is how, and this is why our relationship and our walk with Jesus is so critical. I must believe him. This week we saw and witnessed the funeral and the celebration of the life of Mytonia Newman, a young woman precious daughter, devoted wife and mother, and dear friend, had just turned 43 on November the 7th. She and her husband have, and children had been to, to our church. Her husband, Dr. Naeem Newman, I've known my Tonya her entire life and her family. And to see a young life, vibrant, full of joy and light and to have to say farewell. But there's a song that many artists sing, there's a brighter day after all that is coming. The way that we are able then to continue to hold on to our hope and our trust is because of our relationship with Jesus Christ. It is our connection to him. He is the one that 
enables us to take all of this theology and to make it real so that our walk with him is authentic, that it's just not lip service. There is a power that Jesus provides to us through the ministry of the Holy Spirit when we open our hearts to him and he comes in. It enables us to be able to face death eyeball to eyeball and as friends and family members gave testimony about my Tonya that she was at peace, she was ready. She said, I am ready. I am ready to see my Lord and my Savior. The issue is, will you be ready? Will you be able to rest with the calm assurance when you have come to the end of the allotted time on this earth that God has determined you will live? Will you be ready? Will the promises of his word and the firm assurance of the resurrection, will you be able to, have, with all honesty and confidence, say, yes, Lord, I believe. Right now, we have one of our dear friends and members who's in the hospital, ICU, right now, as a result of COVID-19. Others who have lost loved ones, who were funeralized sisters and relatives and brothers and, and, and loved ones. Does your relationship with Jesus Christ give you the, give you the ability to look through this darkened tunnel called COVID-19 that is snatching away so many lives prematurely, does it give you confidence, your walk with Jesus, so that you are not without hope? This is what his robe of righteousness means. This is why we need it. This is why we cannot rely upon our works. We can't rely upon our intellect. We can't rely upon our religiosities. It must be our connection with our Lord and our Savior. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 16. Yet we know that a person is made right with God by faith in Jesus Christ, not by obeying the law. And we have believed in Christ Jesus so that we might be made right with God because of our faith in Christ. Not because we have obeyed the law, for no one will ever be made right with God by obeying the law. Now, we're going to get to the part where obedience kicks in and the role that obedience plays. But I want you to understand that no one is saved by their own works. We are saved by Jesus. It is his robe of righteousness that we must put on. We're putting on Christ, as Paul tells us. You're not putting on your good works. You're not putting on your best character. You're not putting on your new personality. No. It is the Savior. And this is what he focuses on. So what does it mean to be made right with God? To be declared righteous. To put on the Savior. What does that mean? David gives us a, 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 a clear definition. In Psalm 32, verses 1 and 2. Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sin is put out of sight. Yes, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of guilt, whose lives are lived in complete honesty. I'm going to close with this passage and we'll pick up next week from here. But this is what it feels like. He says, what joy to know that your disobedience is forgiven. He didn't say happiness, but joy, joy that can that can come in the face of sorrow, joy, knowing that when others don't understand and others have forsaken you to know that the Lord has forgiven you and he has put your sin out of sight. You know, there are passages in Micah, I believe it's Micah chapter 7, verse 19. He says, I will cast your sins into the depths of the sea and will remember them no more. And the good thing about God, as I've said so many times before, he does not go deep sea fishing. 
not at all. To know that he is willing and able, has the capacity and the desire to forgive you of your sins and of mine. And he puts them out of sight and out of mind. That is a theological enigma because of God's omniscience. He knows everything from beginning to end. But yet, a God who knows everything that cannot forget, he is saying, I'm going to purposely put my divine attribute of omniscience on hold when it comes to your sins, when it comes to your transgressions and to your iniquity and to your screw ups, even the ones that your spouse might not know about. This is what being declared or made right with God feels like. This is the effect that it has. So when I think about my sins that have been recorded in the book of heaven, in the book of, uh, the book of remembrance, they are registered in heaven. And when I ask the Lord for forgiveness and he writes on that book, pardon, forgiven, or takes his divine eraser and removes it, what makes me think that there's something that I could do that could top that? There is absolutely nothing. So therefore, I then obey Jesus. I therefore bring my life in conformity to what he has told me in his word as a product of my decision to accept him. My obedience then becomes an act of love and a gift of love and devotion because of what he has declared, how he has made me right with God by forgiving me of my sins and freeing me of the guilt. Therefore, that's why David said in Psalm 119, in every verse, he talks about the law of God, how he loves God's law. Thy law have I hid in my heart that I might not, thy word have I placed in my heart that I might not sin against you. My obedience then becomes the fruit of my love for him, I demonstrate my love for Jesus and receiving his declaration that I am now made right with God. My obedience becomes the result of my acceptance of that. What a powerful message of salvation and redemption and restoration the Lord has for us. Next week, we're going to pick up at this from this point because I want to talk about the process of surrender, the process of surrender and how this plays in his robe or mine. But today, I hope that you will come away with a decision that you are saying and come to the realization that there is no work that you can do that can make you right with God. There is no track of obedience or conformity to theological tenets or principles or your adherence to all of the commandments that can make you right with God. There is nothing you and I can do that will make us right, that can restore us in good standing with God. It is only through our faith in Jesus Christ and what he has done and what he is doing for us every single day. Therefore, I want him to come into my heart. There was a song we used to sing, come into my heart, come into my heart, come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Come in today, come in to stay, come into my heart, Lord Jesus. I hope that is your prayer today as we receive his robe as opposed to putting on ours. Next week, we'll pick up at this point and we will dive into this whole process of surrender of how we receive him, how we give our hearts to him. If that is your prayer today, then I invite you to bow with me. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that you have given us your word. We're so grateful that you have loved us with an unfailing love and that you are now declaring us 
holy and righteous and declaring us justified in God's sight. But this is only the beginning. And so now as we prepare uh, to conclude this service, walk with us now, deepen our impression and cement in our minds the precious word of life that you have given and left for us today is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. May God bless you. Have a blessed Sabbath day and we will look forward to worshiping with you next week. Now is the time for us to respond to God's love and provisions. Let us return a thankful tithe and give our generous free will offerings. CCC members may do so by using our online giving link on our church website on your screen. Thank you for being faithful as he is faithful. For those of you who are viewing our service for the very first time, or perhaps you have been viewing on occasion, and have been blessed by this ministry and would like to support it, you can make a donation to the church by using your PayPal and or Cash app as indicated on the screen. Thanks to all for your support. Thank you for fellowshipping with us here at Columbia Community Center. May God be victorious in your life this week, and we look forward to worshiping with you again next Sabbath.